Welcome everyone. My name is Maria Teresa Barbist. I'm one of the board members of uh, SF Artists Alumni. And I'm very excited to welcome today Mark Alice Durand for our spotlight session. I'm going to do a short introduction. Um, Annie Reiniger uh, was actually going to do the introduction, but she had an accident yesterday and she's still in the audience, even with her injury, but I'm going to do a very, very brief introduction. So Mark uh, studied photography at the San Francisco Art Institute and graduated with an MFA in 1985. He is an artist, writer, and publisher. He has a publishing company called St. Lucy Books. And he is also the author of the book Maya Darren, choreographed for cam camera that came out in 2022. And everyone who went to SFAI and studied film there probably knows one of uh, Maya Deren's film, at least, Meshes of the Afternoon, which I actually was watching when I was in film class at, at SFAI. Mark went on to teach at a, a number of um, great institutions, the Art Institute in Chicago, UCLA, Bard College, and is currently teaching at the U University of Maryland. And he's teaching art history and museum studies there. And so um, thank you from all of us, Mark, for doing this talk today. We are so excited to hear from you and I'm handing it over to you now. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, well, thanks, uh, Maria, um, for the introduction. And thanks to you and Annie for inviting me. And thanks to Ujini for uh, facilitating and making it as, all of this happen. Um, it's a great idea. Um, I just think that the, you know, the impact of the Art Institute on my life and you know, obviously generations of artists is so important to keep alive. So I'm really happy you're doing this. Uh, let me, I'm gonna start my screen share. <clears throat> um, let's see. You see that? You might want to go full screen again. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. That works best. Thank you. Okay, That's great. perfect. Well, just these are some of the things I'll be talking about um, in very informally. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I did go to the Art Institute from 83 to 85 and to grad school. And, um, and I want to tell a little story about uh, my friend Annie here um, because... Um, I went to Massachusetts College of Art as an undergrad um, in photography. And uh, after a couple of years of being a musician, um, I decided that, you know, I sort of decided I had to make a career choice, like be an artist or be a musician. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, in my vanity that, um, you know, there's a possibility I could age more gracefully as an artist as opposed to a musician. <laughs> and so I decided to go to grad school. and. Um, I only wanted to go to one place, and that was the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, and so I applied to start in the fall of 1982, and I didn't get in. Um, and Andy was working at the uh, um, in the admissions office, and was I, I called her and tried to get her to explain why I didn't get in. And uh, Andy was incredibly um, gracious and supportive and encouraging. And that was when they had, uh, um, they also had January admissions then. And so um, I applied again for January and I didn't get in again a second time. And um, I was full of despair. And again, Annie provided lots of encouragement and comfort. I just spent a lot of time. Did you, did they make a decision yet? Am I on the list? And um, anyway, so anyway, I feel like my introduction to San Francisco Art Institute was through Annie <laughs> Reiniger. And um, anyway, I've always been very grateful to her for her um, generosity and support. Um, I did eventually start there in, in the fall of 83. So, um, and I studied mostly with um, Linda Connor and uh, Larry Sultan, um, very closely with both of them, and um, who were extraordinarily influential and supportive and generous with me. Um, I also, I worked, did work study there, and so I worked in the library. Um, I worked with uh, Jeff Gunderson 
and Charles Stefanian, who was the, I think the slide librarian at that time. And um, so I worked there for two years and um, anyway, it was good. It was, it was a really great experience. I mean, there was something really beautiful about that uh, space. I mean, we all know that, I mean, just special and uh, unlike any other place that I had ever been, spent time in, in, in my life. Um, and so I stayed in San Francisco for a number of years and eventually left in uh, 89, but I'll get that to that in a second. So I just want to say a little bit about, so I'm going to talk about photography and I'm talking about other kinds of things in my career. Um, and again, I want to leave some time for hopefully some conversation and or questions at the end. Um, I like to say that, you know, my first aesthetic aesthetic experiences in my life were gazing at my parents' wedding album. Um, they were married in 1953, and uh, the most elegant and beautiful thing we had in our home, this sort of working class um, home in, outside of Boston, was the wedding album. And I looked at it over and over and over again. I was sort of obsessed with it throughout my childhood. Um, and I, all sorts of things about it, you know, fascinated me. The ritual of it, the fact that my parents were incredibly elegant and, and good looking. <laughs> And, um, you know, and I, it, the, there was this, all of this sort of mystery and um, kind of like elegance to it. And there's, and, but it was also the fact that there were photographs. There was something about the its relationship to time, the images relationship to time and ritual, um, um, that, that they were both familiar and strange simultaneously, right? That photographs are inherently sort of cut off from time and therefore have this sort of strange power and strange sort of, um, I don't know, um, enigmatic quality to them or inscrutable quality to them. So I think I like to say that, you know, my parents' wedding album was was really my first um, aesthetic experience. And, um, and so then when I was 17, somebody put a camera in my, I was basically a high school dropout and um, this sort of media activist guy who looked exactly like Cat Stevens, if anybody knows who that looked like, who that person is, um, put a camera in my hands and said, uh, if I, you know, you'd show me how to use it. And it just so happened that I was going to a Led Zeppelin concert that weekend. And uh, so I went to Boston Garden and I photographed Led Zeppelin um, when I was 17 and made these photographs. So these are the first photographs I ever made. Um, and uh, this one in particular, just, I remember it's sort of badly exposed and, you know, didn't really work as a photograph, but there was something so magical about it that I was there, you know, making an image of this band that I, you know, was so in the thrall of, um, that this sort of thing, the spell was cast upon me, you know, that I was no longer just a viewer, I was a maker, I was a participant observer and something, I mean, I couldn't use that language then when I was 17, but there's something about that moment of transformation where suddenly I was it, I was just, the photography was it for me. And that I just, it's always been, I've taken many or circuitous path uh, in my life slash career, but photography has always been the kind of central kind of, uh, you know, gr figure of gravity or, you know, and I've always sort of orbited around um, photography. So um, when when I'm sharing my screen, do you see the this the faces from the Zoom faces or you just or you just see the images? Uh, right now, just the images. Okay, good. And your face as well. <laughs> okay, well, um, so I went to Massachusetts College of Art as an undergrad and studied photography. And um, I won't get into that whole, you know, um, pedi you know, sort of educational, you know, experience there. Let's just say that it was very narrow and very, um, it was a kind of, they practiced um, and taught a kind of photography that was very, um, I thought, very provincial and um, very, um, they weren't interested in me, put it that way. <laughs> they were, well, they weren't interested in the way that I was, that I was interested in photography. But I did was that when I was an undergrad, I made this photograph at the Sculpture Garden at the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York. And to me, it was the first photograph that I ever made that I felt like really spoke to me, that it was like somehow magic, that it was, it would belong to me. There was an image that I made that somehow only I could make. And it was a gift. I felt like, really felt like it was a gift. Um, having to do with the simultaneity of gestures, having to do with... Um, you know, a kind of certain blurriness and fixedness, um, this kind of in-between space between a fixed image and an image that seems to be moving. 
Um, and I like that sort of space between the moving and the still image. Um, so like any, I think many artists, you know, I tried to copy this image over and over again for years, trying to make the same image over and over again. Um, I know what's happening here. Yeah, so um, as you can see, I just I came up with a kind of formula, if you will, of like, you know, moving and still and often photographing kids. Um, this is in Berlin in 1983 um, or 84. Uh, anyway, so I just, this uh, uh, during my, years at, at Mass Art and just after I graduated and then my first cup, first semester or two at the Art Institute. Um, so I just want to say this little story. Um, I was now in, I think, finishing my first semester or second semester at the Art Institute. I had, didn't have any critical sort of thinking about photographs before. I was just interested in going into the world making photographs. And, you know, being with um, in an art school, particularly in a graduate program, uh, and especially in that time, there was a kind of shift in the discourse around photographs and around photography and about ethics of representation and that sort of thing. Photographing strangers, you know, what right do we have to photograph on the street, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, the, the language around postmodernism was just coming into the kind of discourse at, in grad school and issues of appropriation and, uh, you know, photographs as cultural objects and not just these sort of windows to the world, um, not just these sort of, you know, um, what's the word, um, you know, neutral images of the world, you know, the windows of the world, that they were in fact, you know, emblematic of a certain kind of privilege and power. And um, anyway, so I was in Berlin and it was when the wall was still up, you know, the Berlin Wall, and I was traveling back and forth between the um, East and West. And Mark, again, that was a certain prank privilege because I was American and I could do that. Oh, just a quick second. Can you hear me? We, we have you drop off ever now and so often. So I'm going to stop your video. That might help a little bit with the connection. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to stop your video. You should still be able to, um, we will still hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. I don't know where I dropped off, but I'll just say that um, I had this uh, encounter as a photographer in Berlin. Um, and I was in East Germ East Berlin, um, which, as you know, was the kind of authoritarian state. No, not it's not working. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm 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 turning the video back on. It's dropping off every, every now and so often, but you're always coming back. So I think we just have to we're we're gonna fill in the blanks. You just if you can turn on your video again. We're gonna go ahead. There you are. Yeah, just go ahead. Don't worry. I'm really sorry about that. It seems like my my connection's okay. Can you hear me now? It, it drops off ever now and so often, so it's kind of just instable. But it's it's okay. Just go ahead. We we we're, we're gonna follow. Okay, I'm sorry. Anyway, so um, I had this encounter with this with this young young boy on the streets of Berlin in East Germany in East Berlin. And um, it was a strange kind of environment where these um, piles of steaming tar were, you know, just dumped on the street in the middle of winter. Nothing, there was no visual hook or, you know, kind of narrative hook. So um, out of the dark came this young boy who didn't see me and was also interested and curious about this sort of strange phenomenon of these this steaming asphalt. Um, you know, in the middle of the street. And so I sort of popped out and started photographing him. And, um, you know, he was kind of shocked by um, by the, you know, my presence. Um, and, you know, was asking me if I was from the police, but I didn't speak German. And I, um, I just kept taking photographs, you know, trying to get the good photograph. And then I realized that he was asking me you know, that he was very much afraid of what I was doing. And then he ran away. And later on, uh, when I came back to San Francisco, I was very full of sort of shame and, um, 
um, I don't know, embarrassed by my lack of awareness of what the power dynamic in that of that encounter. So I sort of scribbled the story underneath, um, and I I showed it. Uh, I actually put it up on the in the hallways at San Francisco Art Institute, and it kind of changed. I don't think it's a good piece or anything like that, but it sort of changed my relationship to photography, in that I wanted to examine, you know, what photographs were, not just as a kind of um, um, document of my experiences, but think about photography on a kind of uh, on a meta level. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, um, but I became really interested in photographs as objects. Um, and somebody I went to graduate school with was somebody named Kathy Clark, um, who is a friend and we collaborated on a number of things. And I was asked to participate in an exhibition in 1985, a public art exhibition about um, the 40th, for the anniver 40th anniversaries of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so out of the blue, Kathy told me that her mom had survived the bombings of uh, Hiroshima, the bombing of Hiroshima. And I was, you know, kind of obviously taken aback by that um, story. And Kathy provided me a picture of her mom, you know, when she was a teenager. Um, and we kind of recreated a certain scene. I, I painted Kathy's photo, uh, feet white and, and photographed her walking across this um, empty lot across from my apartment and south of market and created this sort of photo collage which ended up being a kind of public art project um and um but anyway i just this was a kind of this is a really good example of um my changing my my changing thinking about photographs as sort of cultural artifacts and trying to intervene in them and try to think about photographs not just as windows transparent windows but as you know objects that i could actually intervene upon so that led to a number of, you know, different, you know, using, making large scale photographs with objects, working with installations, thinking about um, the history and context of which in using, you know, appropriated images um, and, you know, just making um, photographic pieces, large scale photographic pieces, installations that had to do with, um, you know, thinking about you know how photographs role photography's role in history we so have just a, uh, just a short comment from david and your 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 voice is very good now so it doesn't break up anymore i just turned the videos off from the other people david meisel was saying interesting combination of word and text with the pieces with the boy from east berlin wondering if jim goldberg's rich and poor work was on your mind at the time just a little comment here Sure, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you, David. Um, so, yeah, Jim's book, uh, Rich and Poor, came out, I think, I don't remember the year, but I think it was around 1980, 81, somewhere in there, um, maybe. And I think I was in grad school when that book came out. And Jim was a good friend of Larry Sultan's, as you know. Um, and so, yes, I... You know whether it's I whether I was I don't remember I was copying <laughs> Jim Goldberg, but certainly the idea of image text relationships was something that was very much in the air. I mean, when Jim Goldberg and there were numerous artists who were thinking about the relationship between image and text, and so yes, that was very much in the air, and um, and uh, as a way of thinking about interrogating photographs of making photographs more complex and not just assume that they're just these windows. Um, so they, yeah, absolutely, David, thank you for images. So thinking about photographs again in immersive installational contexts, um, printing on other kinds of materials. Um, these are all post-grad school. These are now in the early nineties. This is at the Museum of Photographic Arts. in San Diego. It's a terrible bears and flags and video and um, photographs in combination to create these sort of immersive environments. And here are just some of the uh, singular images. And so this is, this is, I'm living in Los Angeles at this point um, in uh, 90, so 92 to 95 ish. making these images and photographs of, you know, Man Ray and uh, Brassai and um, 
my holy nage and that sort of thing. And I wanted to create the mo the richest, most um, sort of aesthetically um, rich photographs I could make, the deepest blacks, the richest whites. I mean, in, in some ways, thinking about my parents' wedding album, <laughs> a very different civic matter in a way, obviously, but um, but thinking it just materially, I wanted to make photographs that were as gleaming and full of luminosity and mystery as those photographs of my parents' wedding album that had so deeply imprinted upon me when I was, in, when I was a kid. And so I made all of these photographs basically in my studio dirt and handkerchiefs and you know just, just making trying to make the most elegant mysterious photographs out of the cheapest you know detritus as possible and i'll get into performance in a second but you know the performative aspects of uh, my work changed you know became very important at this point because i had been doing a number of performances at you know by this point and they sort of the, I, the performative idea worked its way into the photographs So let me talk about performance. Um, I left um, uh, San Francisco in 89 to take a teaching job at the Art School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And while I was there, uh, I met uh, this young British artist named Matthew Wilson, who was doing performance. And um, I was interested in performance, had done some performance, but at the time, performance was really this sort of extension of theater, most performance, as opposed to the work we know from, let's say, the 60s and 70s of, you know, Anna Mandietta or, you know, Carol E. Schneeman or Joseph Boys or people like that. The performance of that moment was really kind of this sort of theatrical burlesque kind of performance of Karen Finley and Holly Hughes and a number of others. But I was really interested in that sort of older idea of performance where the body is, you know, a kind of sculptural vehicle. And so uh, I started to work with Matthew um, and just doing these street performances um, in what we called white collar drag. So we we dressed like we worked in the sort of cubicle next to, you know, in some office, you know, and we always were, we were in Chicago. And so we did a performance a week on the streets of Chicago, always between nine and five, always in the downtown area. We did a number of performances like this one's called, you know, Men Exchanging Fluids. Um, this is in the early in the early nineties when you know a fear of AIDS and the sort of uh, stigma attached to you know male to male contact was really strong, and so we wanted to make a piece that sort of addressed that. Um, so we did that all over the city and continued to make performances in Chicago for the next year um, before I left to move to Los Angeles. Um, there's a piece called uh, Hour of the Hundred Flowers in which we walked with a hundred flowers through the streets of like, Chicago and then placed them in a large grid uh, in um, in front of um, Daly Plaza in downtown Chicago to create this sort of field of flowers. Um, anyway, we did a, a number of different performances in Chicago, um, in that plaza and also other places in, in the city. So the idea is to create these sort of image gestures um, um, we never explained that we were making art. We never told anyone in the art world we were doing it. We just would show up. We would scout locations, obviously, but we were thinking of our own bodies as kind of these sculptural vehicles, right? What uh, Joseph Boys called social sculpture. And if anybody asked what we were doing, we would only recite the title of the piece. So in this case, it was The Hour of the Hundred Flowers. Uh, in this case, it was Men Exchanging Fluids. Um, in, this play, in, in this case, it was uh, 90 Days of Winter. Um, and so we did these various things. And so in 94, I think 94 is at 95, we were asked to participate in an exhibition. I think it was at Southern Exposure Gallery. It was called Workspace. Um, and it had to do with corporate aesthetics and, um, and that sort of thing. And so we were asked to come to uh, San Francisco, do a number of performances. So we performed on the streets at the corner, the, the intersection of, of Market in Montgomery for the um, the course of the entire day. So we started at 9 a.m. So at 9 a.m. we shook hands for 10 minutes. At 10 a.m. we groomed each other for 10 minutes, making sure our ties 
are straight, you know, making sure there's no stains on the shoes. You're basically performing these kind of intimate actions, you know, in a public space. At 11, we embraced for 10 minutes. At 12, this is called succeed. And um, I lost the, toy, the coin toss, so I'm laying on the ground. And it started to rain and Matthew had gotten an umbrella. And um, so I just laid on the ground while, uh, you know, Matthew stood over me. And uh, if anybody asked what we were doing, we, he could only say the word, the, term, the phrase, I've succeeded. <laughs> and this poor woman who's looking at us right now is like, should I, asking if she should call an ambulance. Um, and uh, <laughs> Matthew, by the, our own rules, would only, could only say, I've succeeded. And then there was laugh, in which I laughed in uh, Matthew's face for 10 minutes. Um, scold, in which Matthew twisted my ear for 10 minutes. Dance, we danced for 10 minutes. Cradle. Um, which he, he cr I cradled Matthew. And then lastly, at five o'clock, this is called spit. Um, you can see the flower cart in the background, in which we you know, we purchased a dozen roses each and then proffered a, uh, one rose at a time in, for the other man to, to to bite the head off, to chew and spit back in the face of the other. And at this point, by 5 p.m., we had been performing on that in, at that intersection for the entire day. Um, and so it, kind of, it was kind of like this, people had been seeing us all day long. And um, at, at this point, people were coming out of their offices um, and uh, going to Bard or Muni, whatever, and uh, getting us to, you know, it's like a schoolyard fight. It was the strangest experience. Um, at the end of the spitting all of these uh, roses, we were our beautiful white shirts were completely covered in pink spittle and bits of rose itself was kind Kind of like an amazing image. So the performance aspects. So men of the world, um, where we performed, uh, we worked together collaboratively from ninety one to ninety nine. Um, a number of other projects that were performative, but also photographic. As a piece I did in Los Angeles, it was in uh, part of the. Photography Los Angeles Now exhibition at the LA County Museum of Art. I think it was 95. Um, was this entire velvet upholstered table with a series of these performative acts, uh, which I did in around the Los Angeles River aqueduct um, in downtown LA. And the piece is called called uh, um, an inventory of romantic gestures photographed on 60 millimeter film. Um, and then I printed these sort of vertical triptychs from the, the 16 millimeter film frames. So it involved like running with a flag of surrender, you know, eating daisies, uh, kissing handkerchiefs, <laughs> right? and uh, pouring wine into the river. There's a lot of I autobiographical material behind these gestures, which I won't get into now. If you want to ask me, I'm happy to answer it. But, um, uh, you know, going into the LA River um, with these, with a suitcase of my childhood photographs, I did a number of these sort of gestures around the LA River uh, and then created these sort of vertical triptychs, um, which people at the museum could sort of sift through. Okay, I'm just going to go through this real quick. Oh, these are terrible. Um, but I spent a summer uh, teaching in Florence, Italy, and uh, I had been kind of wanting to make, you know, drawings and collages and that sort of thing. And so I was in the world of Giotto and Fra Angelico and people like that. And so I kept a journal in which I made a bunch of, these are really, for those of you who are actual real artists who can draw, <laughs> you'll just be appalled at my lack of skill. But anyway, I made these sort of gestural images, um, uh, drawings from paintings I was looking at. Um, and uh, and so I decided to create a kind of series of uh, mixed media pieces um, kind of inspired by these drawings and inspired by those late medieval, early, early Renaissance uh, masterpieces. Um, so I started working with uh, airbrush, collage, and uh, performance, you know, to make these sort of uh, mixed media pieces um, that kind of, in, in my mind at least, we're kind of like a combination of the Flintstones and Giotto or something. Um, I'm sorry, that's sort of pixelated, but you get the idea, right? These sort of 
cartoony type of, um, you know, sort of narratives of cause and effect um, that have a kind of, I don't know, old world feeling, but are very, very contemporary in their kind of gestures. So I want to talk a little bit about writing um, and then start talking about publishing. Um, so when I've always been a writer, I've always been interested in writing. Um, and um, one of the great things about being in San Francisco, um, well, first of all, there's so many great at galleries and so many, so much great art, um, non, so many nonprofits showing amazing work. And um, there was this, at the time, there was this, um, a journal or this magazine or publication called Art Week that came out weekly and was basically reviews of shows. And um, and I proposed to write about something and uh, Cecile McCann, who was the uh, editor at the time, publisher, right? Was she the publisher or the editor or maybe both? Um, you know, uh, invited me to start writing for Art Week. And so I wrote almost every week, I wrote a review of like things that I was interested in. Um, and I really got to learn how to do that, you know, to guess be a, an arts journalist. Um, I became a contributing editor and had lots of experiences and opportunities to write shorter pieces and longer pieces. And um, I'm really grateful to, again, for my time in San Francisco for all those amazing nonprofit galleries like Sam Camera Work and Eye Gallery. And um, uh, there are so many others. Um, I'm spacing out um, their names now, but um, oh, um, Southern Exposure. Um, so anyway, as time passed, I started to get more opportunities to write for um, more national and international publications. So I've written extensively for Art in America, Aperture, um, After Image, um, many others. So interests have sort of have remained the same. You know, I've written about photography and performance, for example, for Aperture. Um, I've written about the relationship between photographs and monuments, something that I've been interested in uh, and something as a performer, uh, but also th something I've been interested in as a writer and a curator, which I'll talk about in a second. So, um, and then writing about my, uh, for San Francisco Camera Work Journal. Um, and then I got to write about something, write about Maya for Aperture. And these both sort of, I don't know, set the groundwork for my later writing the biography, Darren's biography. Um, so I've also done a little bit of curating uh, in 2005, six, called Blur of the Otherworldly, Contemporary Art, Technology, and the Paranormal. It has a really beautiful little book uh, catalog. It includes people like Susan Hiller and, uh, um, um, God, I'm spacing out the artist's name, I'm so sorry, um, Mariko Mori. Um, uh, it's anyway, just all these contemporary artists who are interested in the paranormal and manifesting it uh, or picturing it in some way including the work I've done extensive writing now on Ted Sirios, who was a uh, in the 1960s and 70s is kind of like sort of minor celebrity who could apparently, you know, telepathically <laughs> transfer images from his mind onto Polaroid film. Um, and it's, you know, it's sort of ebb and flow of interest in him. And there's a new book coming out this summer uh, I can't remember the title of, uh, but it's about Ted Sirios that Atelier Editions is putting out um, that I've written an essay for. So um, this, I'm interested in this again, the kind of, I guess what you would might say the um, the visual analog of the otherworldly, whether Ted Sirios actually had powers, uh, telepathic powers to, you know, project images onto photographic film is, you know, a, an argument we can have or a discussion we can have at another time. But I'm really interested in the, um, the aesthetics of the otherworldly, you know, the vignetting, the soft focus, all of these things that are kind of like visual analogs for picturing things that are in some ways invisible. Something that's been an ongoing, you know, a kind of interest of mine. So at the Baltimore Museum of Art called Notes on Monumentality uh, and at 
the uh, museum allowed me to go into their archives and use things that they you know had in their historical things and allowed me to borrow contemporary things like this giant afro pick by Sanford Biggers this giant uh, woodcut print extraordinary thing uh, this is a bit, sorry for the pixelated image, but a large painting by Enrique Chagoya. Um, photographs and drawings by Robert Smithson. I really love these just wonderful, you know, proposals for pieces he never did. Um, Oldenburg's, of course, great drawings of his, you know, impossible monuments. Um, and these are a few installation shots. Um, so it mixed the historic and the contemporary. That's, that's a Christian Boltanski monument in the background. Um, and uh, so you can see that just I'm interested in assembling objects uh, in a way that has a kind of, they have sort of discursive relationships in the way, same way that I think about, you know, installations and thinking about now, I think about publishing. So in 20, I'm getting towards the end. So we're, I think the timing is good here. I'll be going for another 10 minutes and it'll be time for um, Q and A. Um, in 2011, I um, started St. Lucy website. It's an online journal basically for a couple of different reasons. One, I wanted to archive, you know, the sort of essays I'd written for obscure journals that didn't weren't online. Um, but then I decided it was really a great opportunity to kind of create a community, um, to invite people to contribute portfolios, um, to do one picture, one paragraph, to have conversations. Uh, my friend David Mizell here is, uh, I did one, it's a really wonderful one with him for that. And so I did that for, I don't know, Basically, the book publishing has taken over, and I don't have time to do this anymore. But for eight or nine years, um, this was a really was my life. Like was doing Saint Lucy, um, doing conversations, writing essays for it, um, or, uh, inviting people to participate in various ways, um, and so it's still there. It's archived. I'm not adding new material these days because there's just isn't time. But you can access it, um, and. Um, but I learned so much from this, you know, from having kind of, you know, a community of people, people, some people I've never met in person, you know, I've just met through, you know, virtually, um, but have really, you know, great working relationships with and in many ways, like prepared, I guess, the ground and prepared me to take on the kind of daunting role of publishing books, which I really knew nothing about. <laughs> so, um, so St. Lucie Books, I started and the idea came in 2016, but really started their first books were in 2017. And um, St. Lucie, the logo comes from this Francesco del Cosa painting from 1474. St. Lucie, if you don't know, is a, um, you know, yeah, no, a Roman Catholic saint um, who in the third century in Sicily, so the story goes, refused to marry a pagan nobleman um, and, uh, you know, there are various versions of the story, but, you know, he, she was tortured and had her eyes plucked out. And one version of the story, she takes her own eyes out and offers him to offers them to her would be suitor by saying, here are your here are my eyes that you want love so much. Now leave me to God anyway. But in the, in the, in the Catholic um, sort of uh, hierarchy, she is the, you know, patron saint of vision and blindness and um and so she, I thought there was a perfect sort of um, symbol for uh, a website now publishing uh, um, I know um, so these are we've just the, our tenth title is Clea McKenna with Is Mark, uh, you, those of you in the Bay Area must probably know Clea McKenna, she's an extraordinary artist. Um, and we've been working together uh, for a year to make this book happen. It's just, we've just gotten the advanced copies and they look extraordinary. Um, so they will be, the official release is September 1st, um, but we have pre-orders happening. But um, so anyway, so there's 10, those are the 10 books we've published so far. And so I just want to go through, this is the first, um, the first shipment of books <laughs> in 2017 that showed up in front of my house and you know i basically had to carry them up into my house and down into the basement and um that's how it all started and uh it started again the first book we did was laura larson's hidden mother um 
and uh, which is this amazing, uh, which is sold out. Um, I have to say this amazing kind of fragmented, episodic uh, meditation on motherhood, absence, presence, photography, using the visual anchors of these uh, hidden mother. Other photographs from the 19th century, temporary um, lyrical text about uh, motherhood. Um, you know, this my published my book, 27 Contexts, is a book that I shopped around to various publishers. And, you know, people were super nice, um, but they, you know, it was like, well, it's what is what kind of book is this? It's not a monograph, it's not photo theory, it's not photo history, it's kind of a memoir. I'm like, it's all of those things. And um, so St. Lucie, I think it's it's uh, several things, but um, St. Lucie is really interested in the relationship between words and images and trying to find a, a sort of space in which text and images are have equal importance. Um, so let me just go through some of these titles here. This is Friends, Enemies, and Strangers by Oliver Wasow that came out in 2018, um, in which he you know, uses photographs. So, well, I think you can sort of do photography. He also makes his own photographs and he also does this sort of tweaking of um, photographs of, um, you know, historical figures. And I think in many ways this to me like this, it, this book was such a beautiful, horrifying document of the Trump era. Um, this is a book that I edited called Running, Falling, Flying, Floating, Crawling, which is, um, but end up being a book. Um, it's really this giant compendium of photographs of the human body, um, of uh, transcendence, of helplessness. Um, and so with the, uh, there's about over 50 artists and uh, 25 writers um, who've taken, the, written these short texts about um, either directly about individual images or about the idea of the human body in any, in, 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 in any or all of those sort of states. You know, these great sort of photographs by the French photographer, Denis Darzac of, um, kind of, I don't know, floating shoppers in Paris. This is a book with um, Odette England, an Australian-born artist who lives uh, in the States now. And it just, this is a book about her growing up on a, a dairy farm in Southern Australia uh, in the 70s and sort of the sort of gendered um, landscape um, and environment that she grew up in as a young girl in this um, in this sort of dairy community. Um, it's really kind of a wonderful, really amazing, amazing book. Uh, the next book was Bree Sutter's 11 Years. Uh, Breeds an ex, you know really fascinating artist who seems to reinvent photography for herself with each um, with each new project. Um, so these are just some spreads from that book. And then this is Laura Larson's second book that we published in 2022 called City of Incurable Women, which is um, kind of like a again a. a um, a meditation on the archive, a kind of reimagining of what historical photographs, how they might speak to us. And so she used these photographs that were taken from the 19th century made by Charcot uh, in this uh, asylum for women. He's a man who sort of like, in many ways, um, kind of puts uh, the pathology to the idea of hysteria uh, um, as a way of, you know, pathologizing women's behavior. And so, um, Laura has taken these historical photographs and made these images in response to them as a kind of visual uh, kind of dialogue um, to uh, reimagine, to create a kind of empathy with those women from the 19th century who were housed in this, um, you know, in this institution. All right, here are some pages from, from Clea's book and I'm almost done. So these are just the advanced copies, uh, which I had three of. And here are some spreads. Um, 
great text by Corey Keller, Leah Ullman, Vanessa Kaufman Zimmerly, and some of Clea's uh, um, writing, her, her own writing. Um, and she walks through various projects, rain studies and other projects like fault lines, um, automatic earth, which are these kinds of rubbings of tree stumps, and then generation, which are these um, kind of uh, embossed, um, I guess, you know, both like uh, embossed photograms of, of textiles. And then lastly, just to mention real quick, so my obsession with With Maya Darren started at Mass Art when I grew up my entire life and um, was always taking any opportunity to show her work to students and to write little essays. And in all of this time, I was just completely confounded why there wasn't um, so many people admire her and have been inspired by her. And there's tons of scholarship about her work, but there was no biography, despite the fact that she had a very brief, very dramatic, very, you know, uh, she hung out with Marcel Duchamp and Joseph Campbell and um, Anais Nin. Um, she was an extraordinary writer. Um, she was very charismatic and photogenic herself, not to mention the extraordinary films that she's made. And the fact that there wasn't any biography always sort of confounded me. Um, and so I decided to take it on. And um, it's something I started in the early 2000s um, and spent a couple of years doing research and writing and uh, doing that kind of thing. And then it kind of failed. I, I sort of lost nerve and then life happened. I had a kid and you know life got busy and I put it away for a while. And then just before the pandemic, I decided that I was would return to it. And so just before the pandemic and then during the pandemic, I spent all of my time just writing the book and it was published in 2022. So here are some spreads from the book. So I, I write through and to the images. Um, you know, she was an extraordinary image maker as a filmmaker, but also was a, actually a very accomplished photographer as well. The, the uh, biography is really richly, um, um, I mean, I, I think of the, the images as sort of um, just as important as the texts. And I sometimes use the images as a kind of gateway to um, start the narrative or to, yeah, to catalyze the narrative. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. Um, yeah, awesome. So yay, glad that's over with. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm gonna... Um... Do you want to stop the screen share so everyone can see yeah. you a little bit better? Yeah. I'm going to spotlight you again for everyone. And we have a couple of questions in the chat as well already. So, and then everyone else, you can turn on your video again um, and uh, also ask questions, put them in the chat or ask them directly. But first, uh, a question by Jude Mooney. Man of the world, I am curious what you hope to impress upon the public the strangers who saw these performances. Was the performance for yourself or to influence change the public in some way or about the public's reaction? Well, I mean, it's a good question. Thank you so much. Uh, all of the above, of course. Um, you know, let's see. Um, Matthew and I were both really influenced by uh, the performances of the 60s and 70s, uh, and particularly feminist, you know, performance artists, right? Um, and um, as two white guys, like, we were thinking about, like, how can we use our bodies, these sculptural vehicles in a public space, right? What what ways can we activate these, these particular bodies in a ways that were... Um, you know, some way self-referential, uh, that were non-threatening, that was expressed a kind of what we thought of as a kind of generosity, um, but also um, we're, we're not ingratiating or self-heroizing, if that's a word. Um, so we thought about our performances as image gestures, right? Um, and as I said, we didn't tell anyone. I mean, we, obviously we had photographs made. We would ask our photographer to kind of come by and take a few snapshots and keep moving on and not just stand there and take pictures because obviously that would change the dynamic. 
but we thought of them as these sort of images, these sort of image gestures that would occur you know, maybe in five minutes or over the course of an hour or maybe the course of a of, from nine to five. And that people could pass through them, they could engage with them or not, but somehow they would exist in people's consciousness, right? Even if just temporarily, or they might remember it later. And we were thinking about, you know, again, the thinking about Joseph Boy's idea of social sculpture, you know, instead of like plopping some big metal thing down in public space, we would have this sort of temporary human transitory, um, um, you know, in some ways fragile, you know, uh, uh, manifestation, a sculptural kind of gesture that would um, exist for, again, for a few minutes, and then it would disappear. And maybe people would take it away and they would go home and tell their partner or whatever, like, I saw these two guys doing this weird thing down, downtown, <laughs> pouring water down each other's throats, or maybe it would be something else. I don't know. We didn't know, obviously. Um, but the idea was to use public space as of a way of creating a kind of what we thought of as a kind of beautiful enigmatic gesture that somehow in some ways was um, critical of or rethinking the relationship, the, 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 the relate the, the assumptions about maleness and about um you know what what two men can do in a public space um that sort of thing so we you know you know I wouldn't say it's completely you know theorized but I mean those are the kinds of things we were thinking about we got another Thank you from, for the question. from Jude if hidden mother is sold out how can I get one and also are you going to participate in any art book fairs in Mother is completely sold out. I have two. I have three. I have three. Um, and uh, there are, you can't find them. I mean, maybe in, I sometimes go on eBay to find some. We printed, I think, 1,500 and they're gone. And there's and so we have no plans at the, at the current moment to reprint it. So I'm, I'm, I really am not, I'm not hiding away 100. You know, I, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't have any. Um, and I do lots of book fairs. Um, I haven't done one in the West Coast, but been to Chicago and uh, New York and Pittsburgh and Boston and, you know, DC and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, uh, the next book fair, I think is, um, I don't know, I think there's a Boston art book fair in November, I think it's the next one. But we did the ICP book fest in, in May, and that was really great. Um, I'd like to come out and do something on the West Coast, I just haven't done it yet. And we have a really nice comment by John Vinay. Um, Thank you for your talk. I was startled to learn you left the city in 1989. It was an honor and pleasure during the early moments of our careers to work with you, helping fuel San Francisco's rich culture of DIY spaces and artist organizations, the Lab, Southern Exposure, New Langton Arts, Kiki, others, and McDonald's Art Space and Hatch's Capstreet Project and braving the commercial gallery system. In my memory, that five-year period of conversations of showing together lasted for decades. I feel very fortunate to have had this foundational opportunity with you and our dear friends, fellow artists, writers, and colleagues. That was very nice. It was touching. Take good care. And then we have one more by David Meisel. Mark, I love what you're doing with St. Lucy Book Publications. What do you have planned for the future of this endeavor? Do you have specific goals in mind or is it more organic than that? And how do you see St. Lucie fitting into the wider landscape of contemporary photography book publishing? <laughs> oh my God. Um, hi, David. <laughs> well, first of all, let me just say to John Wynette, I don't know if he's gone, but um, John was, uh, you know, he and I, and I, we have a career Porges, um, Peter Edland, uh, and there's a whole whole uh, crew of us who um, in the uh, 80s um, and John was part of Crane and Wynette, um, this sort of, you know, kind of collaborative duo. And so John's a very A dear friend and a wonderful artist. Uh, thank you for the yeah kind words. I have no the specific goals. I'm just it's very organic. I um, you know, I, I Saint Lucy started because I couldn't find a, a a publisher for my book Twenty Seven. 
in contacts and I contacted Laura Larson said, so who's publishing your book? Hoping that she could give me an in with somebody. And she said, nobody will publish it because it's, you know, it's not a mem. It's kind of, it's not photo theory. It's not photo history. It's, um, it's kind of a memoir. It's not a monograph. It's like, it, they don't know what it is. And I'm like, right, I'm getting the same reaction. And it occurred to me literally the next day, um, maybe St. Lucy, which I had the online journal at that point, maybe St. Lucy could publish books. And I had gone to book fairs and I knew friends who had started small presses. So I kind of knew it could be done. But it really hadn't occurred to me until that moment. If I started a press, I mean, it was sort of ridiculous. I mean, I, said, I called Laura and I said, if I started a press, St. Lucy Books, would you, could I publish Hidden Mother? And she, without hesitation, she said, yes. And I'm like, okay, that's it. I mean, th and that is like my life pivoted from that moment. On. I was like, that's it. My St. Lucy is my life now. And, um, and I've learned, I mean, it was like, it's been an incredible learning curve, um, but I've learned so much and I've, I've, I've enjoyed it so much for the most part. There's a lot of frustrations as you can imagine, but I, it's generally been just a great experience because as an art and reading and, you know, I just, it sort of fits all my, you know, and I'm a very restless person. So I just felt like, oh, this is a new thing I can learn, right? This is a new way I can be in the world. Um, Cause I got bored. I mean, to be honest, I got bored with uh, exhibitions and it's showing work. And I mean, I had a lot of shows, but, and it was great. And I am very grateful for it, but I was like, Ugh, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. So when the writing thing started taking over the publishing was like, I just, I'm just more engaged on a, on a more, I don't know. I had one day, I just had this idea that I didn't have any more images inside of me. And um, what was I going to do? And instead of mourning that, because it was a really weird feeling, I said, oh, I can write now. <laughs> so anyway, that sort of led me to St. Lucy. And um, so I'll just say that uh, in, to answer your question, David, um, yeah, I'm working with a photographer named Regina De Louise on a project. I'm working on a project for 2024 with uh, Donna Ann McAdams. Um, um, and uh, I'm working on a project with Patrick Pound, who's this Australian artist and collector of vernacular photography. Um, and we're going to do a project together. So I work on one book at a time, and that's all I can do. And so it's I don't have a big production. It's just like, okay, what's the project now? And then I spend a bunch of months working on that. And then I moved. So I mean, I spent a year working on Clea's book, right? I didn't do anything else. I mean, I did some stuff for the Maya Darren book, but I was basically working on Clea's book. So it's just one book at a time. I don't have any grandiose plans except to, because what matters to me is making a beautiful book, but also the relationship that I have with the person I'm collaborating with. That's essential. I mean, that's like, I want to have a really good, positive, rich experience with this person, you know? Um, so that's really my, in many ways, my um, uh, my goal, right? That has these sort of, you know, enriching experiences. And as far as how does St. Lucy fit into the wider landscape, I, I can't really say that. I guess that's for other people to say. I I feel that my experiences in the sort of small art book publishing world have been really positive. Um, it's a very, for the most part, very open, democratic, um, generous kind of community. When I go to a book fair, we enjoy each other. We celebrate each other's, you know, projects. Um, and so I just, um, I've really enjoyed it. I know I don't, I'm not trying to, you know, be the best or the most productive. I mean, obviously I'm not going to be Aperture or MacBooks or something like that, or Radius. They, ever, they all do great work and do different things. I think St. Lucie is about one book at a time, thinking about the relationship between words and images. It's, you know, basically photographic um, and, um, but also working with really extraordinary writers. So thank you Thanks. for the question. Thanks so much, Mark. And can we, can we do the one last question by Annie? Of Holland? course. Yeah. yeah. You started and worked on the Maya Darren book over a long period of time. Did the process thoughts of writing a, a biography change? Is your Maya Darren book a traditional biography? Well, thank you, Annie. I, I, um, I've read a lot of biographies. I'm trying to find models. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of approaches, right? Um, so I, I'll just say this, you know, one of the reasons I failed initially in the early 2000s was 
I was trying to do something too complicated, too fancy, if you will. I was trying to um, structure the book in a way that sort of mirrored uh, Maya Darren's editing strategies. You know, she had this idea of the way that, you know, one image would transform into the next, that they didn't follow necessarily certain kind of linear logic, but kind of like just at in, you know, in, in the structure of my book. And certain, you know, segues worked, but to put the character that over the course of the entire I mean it, it began to seem really artificial and like impossible and I so I'd set up this structure that um basically doomed me to um and that's when you know and then time passed I'd written a whole bunch of other stuff and I think I, I hopefully became a better writer um and then I realized that actually her life was so complicated. Actually, the best way to approach it is totally chronological, like start with her birth and end with her death. And like, I don't, I don't get into a native scholarship on her, uh, on her work. I wanted to tell the story of her life, you know, and through, she was a, a fanatical journal keeper. Uh, she was also an, a very prolific writer about um, film um, so there was lots of material to, not to mention all the extraordinary, I mean, just literally thousands of images that she made. So there was lots to work from. Um, so it was more like, okay, how do you, how do you narrow it down? And then the last thing I'll just say about, uh, is it a traditional biography? I decided that it's, it's, there are no footnotes, right? There are sources in the back, you know, I list all the sources, um, but I decided to really prioritize the story aspect of, and to write it for a general audience. And so um, it's not a scholarly book, it's informed by scholarship, but it is really privileging, uh, prioritizing the story aspect of it. Um, and I do take some freedom to imagine certain moments moments in her private life, you know, through what I know about her. Uh, but certainly I think those are pretty clear that those are kind of, you know, I'm imagining them. Um, but they're, you know, but the basic book is it's traditional in the sense that it's from cradle to grave and it it sticks to the facts of her life. Um, yeah. So I think that answers the question, right? Thanks, Annie. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm going to uh, stop the recording now so everyone can kind of say goodbye and say their thanks. So hold on just a second.